Asia uh, varies from countries to countries because uh, countries like Singapore, where it's a little bit more developed, um, so we may have a little bit more targets that is applied for net zero. Um, so it could be related to um, re- uh, new buildings, building of new buildings, and also kind of like. Hello everyone, welcome to the Actionable ESG Talk Series brought to you by AKFI Actionable Knowledge Foundational Institute, the world's first non-profit industry association committed to bridging the gap between ESG, sustainability and digital transformation. My name is Isabella, I am the co-host here with Manuel and other co-hosts today. Uh, he's also the executive director at AKFI. Thanks to this talk series, we get to bring together great minds to together discuss the current state and the future state of ESG, sustainability, and digital transformation. I'm delighted to announce our special guest today, uh, Farah. Farah, thanks for taking the time joining us. Um, just a little bit about Farah to our audience. She is an expert on blockchain technology as the <laughs> underpinning of virtual currencies and uses in the financial sector. Um, she has quarterbacked the development of solutions generating millions in revenue for tech industry leaders such as Digix. Um, and she has background also including pioneering advanced analytics solutions and leading digital transformations at blue chip companies like Dial and L'Oreal. Um, um, Farah, based on your diverse background and seasoned experience in blockchain and tech industry, what are your insights on the current state of ESG and sustainability trends and how digital transformation do you see can track progress in sustainability? All right, thank you, Isabel, for the question. Uh, also, thank you, Manuel, for um, inviting me on this webinar. Okay, so in my opinion, the world is facing a catastrophic future if you don't act soon to restore and protect the physical environment. And unfortunately, these losses of um, natural capital, not just not only uh, worsen the global economy or the global warming and intensify um, the impacts of climate change, but it also um, reduces or stunts the uh, economic growth, disrupting supply chain, and eventually um, affect the provision of essential goods and services. Um, given my background in financial services, um, I believe that as uh, banks and financial intermediaries, um, they play an essential role in addressing this crisis by valuing natural resources and achieving um, nature positive outcomes, a concept that both combines financial investment with nature protection, regeneration, and sustainable use of resources. Now, the word sustainable use of resources, this is where um, digital transformation comes in because it allows the use of emerging technologies, existing technologies together with some use, use cases related to innovation to help companies achieve their sustainable uh, finance goals, right? Um, so uh, in my point of view, um, the capital in industry by itself is, is in a transitional stage or period where it has opportunity to adapt to various digital trends and technologies um, in order to innovate with new business models, um, you know, in, towards their existing products and services. Um, so one area where the banks specifically can facilitate a nature positive economy is by developing a novel financial products based on nature and biodiversity. So this can be in terms of like green bonds, debt for nature swaps, blue bonds and biodiversity uh, credits that can help to expand on the nature market and reach the biodiversity uh, link investments. Um, so, for for example, here, right, um, I want to talk a little bit more about syndicate, uh, syndication loans. So, maybe before I go deeper into that area, I'll, I'll explain to you guys um, what is the process like. So, loan syndication, um, in specifically in financial services, right, involves multiple parties coming together to provide financing for a borrower, typically a, a large corporation or government entity, right? So this is where they will spend their money, a large amount of um, their loan amount across a group of lenders 
or investors for certain types of infrastructure projects, for example, um, you're building a railway in a country or things like that. However, this process is not just limited to access the borrower. Um, it also extends the lenders as well as the downstream impacts to mitigate risk by sharing the risk exposure to the borrower and enables the borrower to access larger amount of capital that they might be able to secure from a single lender. So um, typically for loan syndication, they have about seven different types of process. Um, so for example, the first one, the origination, right? The loan syndication always begin with um, the, the first step whereby the borrower seeks financing for a specific pro um, procedure or purpose, for example, to uh, to fund a large project, uh, infrastructure project, for example. And then you need to break down the structure of the syndication loan, loan right? Um, the, the bank will work with the borrower to structure the syndicated loan, um, not just determine the loan and the you know, typical interest rate and repayment terms, but also identify the um, who may be interested in in terms of like participating in this syndication based on their risk appetite, investment criteria, and the relationship with the borrower. So this is where um, the ESG aspects comes into place, right? So the bank, for example, will have its own core values, right, with regards to ESGs, uh, typically in um, towards the governance and social aspects of it. And the problem with the ESG, because it's so new, um, is that it's very hard for the bank to kind of like come up with a streamlined approach and standards, not just for reporting, but also for them to kind of like um, have a proper sustainable uh, finance reporting system, right, uh, in order for them to measure their own ESG matrix. Um, so this is where the marketing and the allocation comes into place, right? So the the arranger will try to market a syndication, a syndicated loan opportunity to potential lenders, which uh, typically may extend to commercial banks or investors or even PE firms, right? And then they have to prepare detailed information with regards to the terms of the loans, borrower's credit profile, the purpose of financing, and also the um, interest from potential participants based on their ESG criteria amongst other investment criteria. And then after that, right, um, they will have to kind of like evaluate the indication of the interest and allocate portion of the loan um, to the participating participating lenders and investors before negotiating terms and pricing and the participating lenders to finalize the syndication. And the fifth part of it, which is where the documentation and closing comes into place, uh, this is also where you determine your ESG matrix, um, your KPIs, right? So for example, we may not have more than maybe four KPIs, but you need to measure each one of them. And you may not be successful in the, in all four KPIs, for example. You may be only be successful in, in two of them. But that's still okay because it's still a start, right? Um, um, and then if the other two matrix, you do not do well on it, um, you figure out a way to, to kind of like improve on it. And that's where uh, we talk about the um, uh, DMA, also known as uh, it's known as uh, let me forget, the double maturity assessment, right? Which is where companies involved, um, parties involved in this indication are using to uh, using this matrix to identify um, what is important for them when it comes to sustainability. Okay. And from there on, right, they will kind of like uh, use this um, matrix to handle all the servicing activities, such as collecting payments, um, uh, you know, the matrix that comes along with the ESG, the data that comes along with it, and monitor the compliance with the loan convenience and facilitate the communication between borrowers and lenders. Um, the last part of it, um, these syndication, these syndicated loans may be, may be trading in a secondary market, allowing lenders to buy and sell their loan participation to other investment. And it provides liquidity and flexibility for these lenders to manage their portfolio and may occur through um, direct negotiations between investors and through loan trading platform. Um, so in, in my point of view, this loan syndication process plays a um, crucial role in facilitating large scale financial transactions, right? Because there are large scale financial transactions, it's important for this um, borrowers to access the capital markets efficiency and to, to help them diversi diversify their loan portfolios and manage risk for sustainable finance. Um, 
And typically, um, loan syndication, it comes into area. Uh, one of it is through what we have already known is the green loans, uh, whereby it allows the use of proceeds to facilitate finance um, specific pools of ESG assets. So that's where I mentioned about the double maturity assessments. This is where the banks use this um, standard to measure their performance against the metrics in that double maturity assessment. And the second part of it, which is a still growing area, um, it's about uh, sustainability link loans, um, also known as SLL. Um, so they are basically purpose loan, general uh, purpose loans, um, but they are tagged to ESG key metrics performance, KPIs basically, key performance uh, indicators, right? Um, they are ex explicitly written in their contracts and explicitly uh, stated in their loan documentation in, into one of the processes related to this syndication, right? So if the borrowers fail to meet the targets, um, it will have an impact on their credibility. That's why um, it's important to to understand which metrics are applicable for a type of loan, right? Because you want to make sure that um, the borrowers not just, you know, pay back the loan, but also meet your KPIs, right? Because it's um, it's not just the borrower who will be impacted, but also the bank and also the downstream um, investors and parties that are involved. Um, in, typically in EMEA, right, um, we use SLL um, and tag it to two to four, maximum four per transaction. Um, it differs from from one loan to another, depending on the penalty or benefit, and depending on the type of loan. Infrastructure project may have a little bit more KPIs, for example, uh, um, decarbonization, um, net zero, net zero targets. For example, if it's an infrastructure project, then you know it's a lot more easier to achieve those targets uh, versus something that is related to uh, supply chain, for example, because supply chain may have more social factors as compared to environmental factors or even governance factors. So it's things like that that is, might differ from project to project. How we see it being implemented in Asia uh, varies from countries to countries because countries like Singapore, whereby it's a little bit more developed, um, so we may have a little bit more targets that is applied for net zero. Um, so it could be related to um, re uh, new buildings, building of new buildings, and also kind of like having um, implementation of uh, air conditioners, right? How do we ensure that the building is actually a green building versus that in a developing country whereby they have more um, supply chain related project. For example, I'm, um, I am a company that sells uh, coffee beans. Right, so my KPI matrix may be related to who am I hiring, the age group, and what is the minimum payment. So it has more uh, environmental and social aspects to it, as compared to uh, the governance aspect uh, component to it. Yeah, that would so, in general. Experience. I'll try to yeah. unpack a little bit because I think for our our audience, uh, some may be really intimately uh, knowledgeable about the banking industry. I'll start with myself, I'm not. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, saying that, uh, here is what I understood so far. These loans are syndicated. I assume they are syndicated by international groups. Uh, there are, the convenance of the loans are probably uh, tied, not probably, they are tied to two sets of metrics as indicated, uh, which is double materiality. One is financial, it's payback terms, it's uh, use terms. And the other is meeting KPIs in the sustainability. And I have a couple of sort of more detailed questions. First thing, is my understanding correct? Yeah, it is. Thank you. The, the, yeah, other, question, <laughs> the other question is, I imagine that uh, the finance industry is regional or global. So different uh, different uh, banks are actually subject to uh, local regulations, local uh, uh, constraints in sustainability. Uh, so who, who is managing sort of the loan? Because now you have a, a number of bank participants or, or financial institution participating, uh, but somebody has to oversee the whole uh, the whole syndicate, right? Yeah, you're, you're right. So somebody has to um, facilitate uh, the entire loan and somebody has to audit the entire loan. So because the area is so new, 
um, the framework may not be as advanced. Uh, so we typically use uh, frameworks related to pillar, pillar three or sustainable finance or seek the help of our uh, internal auditors. Because eventually the banks will have to report for audit. So you want to make sure that whatever key matrix that uh, we are applying will also meet the standards of our auditors. And that means so actually you brought forward and thank you for that. The aspect of technology, uh, as uh, Isabella already mentioned, uh, the blockchain, it's, it's one of your expertise. So uh, th this is one way to track uh, the activities. Is it currently used or is more on a sort of experimental stage, the, the use of uh, the blockchain ledger? The use of the blockchain ledger is actually still in the experimental stage um, because um, the most important usage of the blockchain technology is that it provides transparency of data and act, uh, transparency of activities that are involved in the entire end-to-end um, -end process. Um, so that that um, transparency is often um, giving us the data insights into what is going on. So for example, if let's say um, I am an oil uh, or rather a metal mining company um, and I would like to use blockchain to give me the matrix with regards to environment. So how much water am I using? Uh, what is my carbon matrix? So when I use the blockchain ledger, it gives me the details of all those, right? And then this matrix, the details of this matrix can be used in reporting. So in my ESG reporting for my audit, but also not only that, but also my ESG reporting to my clients because most of my clients involved, they are all enterprises. And typically because um, ESG is such a hot topic now that it's important that um, companies uh, meet some of their ESG targets because it impacts who are their customers. It determines uh, which companies or clients they want to um, associate themselves with because their customers, especially when you're dealing with um, uh, uh, Gen Zs or, or you know the millionaires, right? Whereby uh, ESG is, is a bigger concern for them. Um, then this matrix would matter. So while blockchain is still a new technology, um, you know the use cases are still being explored. It, it does have an impact or rather some visibility um, with regards to the data that is helping us uh, to give an insight and then eventually some innovation or uh, or actions that they need to take to uh, achieve their ESG goals. Yeah. That's, and and uh, uh, I know Isabella may have a question about the use of AI. Uh, she, but as I mentioned uh, in, in other videos, she's a published author uh, of, uh, yes. of the digital mind of tomorrow, or maybe the digital mind of today, Isabella. <laughs> So Thank there's you. here off for AI. Uh, oh. Isabella, do you see Are you off asking for me or? Yeah. Oh, of course, of course. Um, I think AI has a very critical role across that industry and every, um, every companies right now. Um, we need to reconsider our position when working with machines and artificial intelligence. Mm. And I also believe this is part of the uh, ESG initiative, uh, part of the social, part of the governance, how to regulate artificial intelligence, how humans should behave in front of the camera, in front of the uh, devices. Uh, should we rely on them 100% uh, to what percentage uh, should we leverage them? Um, all these kind of ethical questions we should consider moving forward and including the environment, the data center, uh, it's burning tons of uh, energies right now and which is a hard fact for a lot of us to consider into our equation. So uh, I do think AI has a critical role in defining uh, the future of ESG sustainability and our humanity in general. Um, just a quick question because I'm not an expert uh, not, or rather not very um, aware of the AI imp implementation in different projects, right? Uh, can you give me, just for my own curiosity, can you give us an example um, of how AI can be used in digital transformation um, in any area that you're very comfortable with, for example, 
um, maybe inclusion, diversity inclusion, or or in, towards infrastructure for human beings. Uh, for diversity, you mean in uh... diversity or inclusion? So, for example, um, mm -hmm. making sure that our trains or our, our um, you know, public transport. So maybe even me walking, a blind person walking down the street, right? How is it applicable to make sure it's safe for them? Uh, can you can you repeat the last part? How that about? Okay, so for example, um, uh -huh. uh, in, in in Singapore, right? It, we have very good transport systems, but right. it may not necessarily be advanced when it comes to making sure that it's actually inclusive for different types of people. So I'm uh, in, in the MRT station or the train station, we may have lift um, to help uh, the a person who is handicapped or in a wheelchair bound to take the train up, to take the train, right? Because you use mm -hmm. the lift. But what are the other areas, right? Uh, when it comes to AI that can help to drive inclusion and diversity, you know, just, just out of curiosity, slightly different topic, but yeah. <laughs> I can maybe step in a little bit, but what you describe it's a, it's a real time um, kind of situation where the AI system can detect actually delay the train mm -hmm. if you want. So this is sort of a more basic function of AI. But if you uh -huh. move into sustain, so essentially uh, without taking face pictures of the people or identifying the people in the in 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 your uh, case in your. Uh, it can also uh, just monitor and if it's a difficulty for somebody to get on the train, will delay the train, will not let the train depart. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a fairly, I would say, straightforward application. But you also uh -huh. asked a question about sustainability. So uh, in ESG reporting, in, uh, as you know, the uh, the CSR documents, the CSO documents, Chief Sustainability Officer documents, are primarily text. And there are, it's extremely good with text an analysis and comparing different reports and so on. So automating the function of uh, measuring, if you want, the uh, or, or estimating rather than measuring the uh, performance in ESG, it will, uh, it will be another case. Uh, going back to what you do with blockchain and uh, especially with a uh, cryptocurrency called Ethereum, not, not, block, uh, not Bitcoin, they actually have enforceable contracts. So that's another aspect of digital transformation AI where the okay. contract can be automated and uh, um, uh, it's not, you know, it cannot be changed on, on the uh, so, so the machine actually takes over the contract and the execution. So there are many, many examples. And uh, of course, uh, I, I don't know, uh, Isabella, I'm sure you have another ton of examples of AI, uh, especially in the ethical part, right? So when you talk about yeah. diversity and the insurance, you look at the ethics of, of the AI system. So, Isabella, back to you. Yeah, I saw Farah was kind of uh, uh, interested in, I guess, on uh, more the uh, human side of how technology uh, could kind of uh, uplift the uh, human assistance in, for example, public trans transportation uh, and things like that. Uh, and especially in Asia, I don't know about Singapore, uh, for example, China, there's all these cute little robots actually running around everywhere for deliveries and in hotels for, uh, for services. And I uh, do see that in public service as well, uh, when each uh, writers need any specific uh, assistance, um, those type of uh, uh, machines uh, could join the process right away to bring up a bottle of water or to uh, move, help you to move into the right, uh, right seat and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's actually moving very fast. Um, okay. Yeah. I see. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe I need to read your book. <laughs> oh, happy to have another chat, Farah. I'm so happy you're interested in such topic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and of oh. course, we'd like to have you back also to, you know, a conversation <laughs> on AI and banking once you, you know, you, you go a little bit uh, deeper in that field because the uh, blockchain is and uh, the uh, 
the trust system, it's also part of both of AI and of the banking system, right? You cannot do anything in banking without establishing a relationship of trust. Exactly, exactly. And, and eventually it's trust and risk, right? If you mm -hmm. look at the, the main lever, yeah. levers of, of the banking system. So, no, this, this is a very exciting uh, conversation. I, uh, um, I would like maybe, you know, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll uh, promise you to invite you back. And uh, maybe I think there is one more question, uh, Isabella, that we usually reserve to our uh, guests uh, looking into the future of uh, sustainability and yeah, thank you, thank you. Now, well, and Farah was very impressed on your res um, bio, not resume, bio that you mentioned. You are also a uh, global leader uh, committed to educating the tomorrow's generation to shape the uh, digital leaders in the future. Uh, you are the mentor. Um, try, uh, trying to mentor women through the organization called a Global Digital Excellency um, Association, and you are serving on the Board of uh, Advisory right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Based on your observation and your um, your burden, uh, no, I'll say I'll say your commitment uh, for the future. Uh, what what are your recommendations for the students, the next young generation? professionals uh, who are seeking a career in sustainable focused consulting or management or uh, in general of digital transformation? Um, I think there's, there's three parts to it. So we talk about digital transformation, the industry wise and then ESG topics, right? So these are three areas and eventually, um, maybe 20 years ago, you can, you can work in a silo area. Now you need to be an expert in all three areas and I see all three areas converging into one. So it's important for someone, um, regardless of your number of working experience that you have, it could be a student, it could be a professional, but learning is, a, is an ongoing thing. Um, it's a process that, that has to continue regardless of your age. Um, so learning about your industry, mastering it, being an expert in the industry in and out, knowing the upcoming trends. That's one part of it. The second part of it is understanding the ESG components of it. So for example, carbonization, net zero, right? The governance aspect of it, especially the governance aspect of it, whereby it's the most difficult um, assessment or a criteria to meet. Um, so knowing the upcoming trends, um, listening to podcasts, getting engaged in um, the conferences that comes along with it, um, keeping up to date about the problems a country is facing and industry is facing um, uh, will give you a value add um, towards what you can achieve or what you can look for in your current job or in your future jobs and also how you can uh, value add or or help your client to achieve some of these goals. So that's one part, second part of it. The third part of it um, is the, the technology component of it, right? Um, you may not be an expert in terms of like developing a certain solution, a certain product, that's fine, but you need to know um, the, 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 fund the foundations of the technology and where it can help you achieve the goals that the company wants to achieve or you want to achieve. Then knowing that, and then you kind of like streamline together, narrow down the use of technology to help achieve the ESG goal, a particular industry that is interested in, or the country, uh, the company that you're helping, the company that you're working for wants to achieve. So conversion of these three areas, staying curious and then um, trying to be an expert um, in at least one of those areas would help you to uh, start or have a successful career in ESG. Yeah. Amazing. I love this uh, holistic uh, structure covering three areas. So, no, thank you. And uh, you, you know, we talked in previous uh, videos about uh, something which we call transdisciplinary, not multidisciplinary, mm -hmm. the yeah. ability to, if you want to speak multiple languages, the language of technology, the language of ESG, the, the language of uh, um, sustainability and, in your case, financial. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Manuel. Yeah. Thank you, Farah. 
Um, and thank you to all of our audience for taking the time joining us today. Make sure to tune in every week for a new episode of AKFI's actionable ESG talk series, where you can gain new perspective on how to mitigate risk and create value by integrating ESG and digital transformation. Thank you so much, Farah, again, for all your insights and your sharing. Uh, until next week, goodbye for now. Bye, Farah. Thank, Bye you. Now. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye, Bella. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye, you. bye. bye.